Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's conference, Overview of African Horse Sickness. Please note that all audio lines are muted during the call. You may ask a question to the chat at any time during the presentation, and please send your chat questions to all panelists. If you need assistance joining the conference, you may send a chat to the event producer. Please note that the conference is being recorded. And with that, I'll hand the call over to Liz Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with APHIS BS Training, and I'd also like to welcome you to today's webinar. Our speaker today is Dr. Tracy Sturgill. She is currently the Assistant Director for Regionalization Evaluation Services, RES, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Before joining RES, her previous positions included both veterinary medical officer and section head for the equine ovine section of the Diagnostic Virology Laboratory at the National Veterinary Services Laboratory in Ames, Iowa, and section head for the Diagnostic Services section at the Foreign Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory on Plum Island. Dr. Sturgill's equine focus continues through participa participation in the equine program during her undergraduate work at Moorhead State University in Eastern Kentucky and eight years of large animal, predominantly equine veterinary practice following veterinary school at The Ohio State University. Leaving practice, she returned to graduate school for her PhD at the Gluck Equine Research Center at the University of Kentucky, followed by a postdoc at the University of Georgia. The focus of both was on equine neonatal immunology and infectious disease. In her spare time, she enjoys remodeling her home, building or refinishing furniture, and gardening. She is a people person and has greatly missed in-person interactions with others this year, as I'm sure we all have. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to um, Dr. Sturgill. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Before we get started, I would like to provide a disclaimer and warn those of you who are watching that there may be images and videos in this presentation that may be very difficult to watch. <clears throat> the first of these images, uh, th this horse is a uh, horse that's been affected by the pulmonary form of African horse sickness. And as you can see by these, uh, these images, this is a very devastating disease for both the horse, their owners, and any handlers. Uh, we'll get further into this later in the presentation, and you'll see a lot more pictures similar to these. I'm showing them to you now so that you'll have them in mind as we discuss the, the, uh, the clinical presentation, the history, and the, uh, the, the presentation itself. As I mentioned, there will be more uh, pictures similar to this later in the presentation. The African horse sickness is known by a lot of different names. In the Latin, it's known as pestis equorum, which is translated into horse plague. In South Africa, there are very there are several very descriptive names. In Afrikaans, there's prodesiac or horse sickness, and the subacute or cardiac form is known as dicot prodesiac, otherwise known as fathead. And the acute or pulmonary form, which is known as dentop prodesiac or thinhead. And you'll see why they use these na these very descriptive names later on. The earliest written description that we have of the African horse, what we know as African horse syndrome or African horse sickness, uh, occurred as early as the 1300s in the Middle East. The book Hippiatria, which was written in the 15, in 1532, describes a much earlier outbreak that occurred in 1301. And also in the 1500s, there are records from Zambezi that were recorded by the Dutch East India Company. And this was following uh, importation of a number of horses into that region. And also in, 19, in 1712, numerous epidemics occurred throughout Italy. In the mid-1800s, several outbreaks occurred in South Africa. And in these outbreaks, as many as 65,000 horses died in, in each of those outbreaks. It's really hard to imagine the devastation that this disease has actually caused. Around the turn of the 20th century, a large number of horses were imported from Europe into South Africa for the Boer War. And they proved to be much more susceptible than the locally sourced horse breeds, and many succumbed to the disease. <clears throat> a lot of research and various treatments were tried also during those years in an attempt to determine the cause of the, virus, of the disease and improved survival once they were affected. It was during this time that the African horse sickness was determined to be viral in nature. 
For those of you who like the science, African horse sickness is a non-contagious arboviral disease of horses, well, equids. It's a double-stranded RNA virus that belongs to the Rio Viridae family, and it's one of many orbiviruses. Other orbiviruses include blue tongue, which affects numerous species, including sheep and goats, cattle, deer, and antelope, epizootic hemorrhagic disease, which significantly affects deer, cattle, and even buffalo, equine encephalosis, which is another uh, disease of horses, which has only been reported in South Africa and Israel, and Ibaraki, which affects cattle and is very similar to blue tongue. <clears throat> There are nine stereotypes of African horse sickness virus, uh, which can be identified by using the virus neutralization test. Certain strains do exhibit some cross-reactivity with other strains, but it's not a very broad cross-reactivity, as you can see from this list. The viral genome itself has 10 segments that code for 12 proteins. Of these proteins, the VP2 trimer, seen at the top of this diagram, is a spike protein on the outer shell. It's important to rep receptor binding, to viral entry, and to type-specific neutralization. In fact, it's this protein that's used to determine which strain is causing disease. This virus is very stable, and it's been shown to be infected even when recovered up to two years uh, after a post-collection of blood. <clears throat> Equids are solopeds, which means they're animals with a single hoof on each foot, and these include horses, donkeys, mules, and various wildlife species of zebra and onagers, as well as wild asses. Mules and hennies, for those of you who aren't aware, are crosses of horses and donkeys. Morbidity and mortality rates can vary with the species of the animal, previous immunity, and the form of the disease. The horses are particularly susceptible, especially where mixed and pulmonary forms tend to predominate, and the mortality rate is usually as high as 70 to 95%. Mules, which I mentioned are cross between horses and donkeys, have a mortality rate of about 50%, while Asian and European donkeys, the mortality is about 10%, 5 to 10%. And African donkeys and zebra, the mort mortality is extremely rare. And other than mild fever, infection in zebra and in these African donkeys is usually subclinical. There's some concern that zebra may have a carrier state and be a reservoir for the virus. Um, Animals that do recover from African horse sickness do develop a good immunity to the infecting serotype and sometimes partial immunity to some of the other serotypes. <clears throat> In the early 1900s, it was observed that dogs that ate infected meat could also become infected, and they often died of a parakeet fatal infection. Subsequently, various outbreaks of dogs have been reported, and all of those have had well-documented histories of ingestion of horse meat. In 2013, though, something really strange occurred. There was a dog that was living in an, in an accredited research facility, which is a, a controlled and monitored environment, and that dog contracted African horse sickness without any history of having ingested infected meat. This is the first scientifically documented case of a dog infected in this manner. <clears throat> when dogs get infected, illness is fairly short, often just a week long. They do develop severe hydrothorax, or fluid, in the chest, as you can see in these images. The lung tissues fill with fluid along with the airways. Other tissues also become congested and very heavy. So interestingly, in this facility, in addition to the sick dog, there were other animals, other dogs, that Sierra converted to the virus, although they didn't die. Um, they had elevated antibody titers. And when they did a study on this, they actually showed that Labrador breeds, which there were numerous of, actually had two and a half times uh, like, we're likely to have two and a half times uh, higher serological titers than the African breed dogs. And it was previously thought that dogs didn't really play a significant role in epidemiology of African horse sickness, but this is under further investigation. <clears throat> in addition to dogs, camels and monkeys have also been shown to become infected. In camels, it's very rare and it's non-clinical. There aren't any details available on the level and duration of the viremia if there is one. In contrast, monkeys develop encephalitis or, or inflammation, of the, inflammation of the brain when, when they've been experimentally infected. And it's likely that they don't have a significant role in epidemiology due to the distribution of both the monkeys and uh, the disease itself. 
Other species that have developed antibodies post-exposure include angora goats, African elephants, and rhinoceros, which are actually a close relative to equids. Stereotypes one through eight are typically found only in areas of sub-Saharan Africa. In contrast, type nine is much more widespread and has been responsible for virtually all epidemics outside of Africa. The exception to this being the Spanish, Portuguese, Spanish and Portuguese outbreak in the late 1980s, which were due to stereotype four, and more recently in Thailand and Malaysia where stereotype one was the culprit. <clears throat> Numerous outbreaks have occurred in South Africa over the last decade, and because of the regular outbreaks, South Africa has established control zones. Looking at the image on the left, South Africa has a free zone. It's that small area in green that's surrounded by a minimum 50-kilometer surveillance zone in blue. blue. This uh, surveillance zone is where regular uh, counts of equine numbers and the regular surveillance occurs. Surrounding the blue zone is a, a minimum 100 kilometer protection zone, or the orange area. And in that area, they, they perform compulsory vaccination of all equids. The red area on the far right side is considered affected. The free and the surveillance zones, the blue and the green, are also protected from, uh, against the natural spread of the virus from the rest of the country by a mountain range that actually goes between the blue and orange region and by other geographical barriers such as desert areas. <clears throat> South Africa it, uh, has very strict movement controls that so have been applied for movements of equids into the controlled area to prevent incursion of AHS from both the, uh, the orange and the red zone. <clears throat> it's been known for well over a century that this virus is transmitted by insects and while certain tick species have been shown to become infected and transmit the virus, as a vector, they don't really have a significant role. Culicoides, or biting midges, are the primary insect vector for this virus. So transmission of the virus, the midges will feed on the host. The Extrinsic incubation of the virus occurs within the midges, and this takes usually approximately eight days to occur. Transvarial transmission or overwintering of the virus in larvae of the midge doesn't appear to occur. Transmission is uh, returned back to another equid, which then develops a viremia, where the, the virus is actually multiplied to very high levels in the body. Additional midges feed on that animal, thus restarting the cycle. <clears throat> African horse sickness can be transmitted by several species of culicoides and can be both seasonal and epizootically cyclical. It's often associated with droughts followed by heavy rain. This virus is not transmitted by contact. While numerous culicoides species are known to transmit African horse sickness in the field, culicoides imicola appears to be the principal vector. However, in North America, uh, Culicoides veripinus has been shown to be an efficient vector in the laboratory. The mosquitoes and various biting flies may have some role in virus transmission, but it's not as significant as that of midges. As you all likely know, uh, mo mo moist mild conditions and really warm temperatures, as we find in the south, favor the presence of insect vectors, and wind has been implicated in the dispersal of, of these vectors in uh, some epidemics. It's been postulated that spread can occur via wind over great distances, as much as up to 400 miles over water and 90 miles over land. To date, there haven't been any known outbreaks of African horse sickness due to the use of infected semen, ova, or embryos. Nonetheless, infected semen has been the cause of transmission in other equine diseases think equine arteritis virus. Uh, the OIE terrestrial code chapter on African horse sickness has recommendations regarding the importation of equine semen and for the importation of in vivo derived equine embryos and oocytes. These can be found in chapter 12.1 of the equine terrestrial, the OIE terrestrial code and the parts are eight and nine if you'd like to read more. This map shows the worldwide distribution of major coelicoides species. 
Warming temperatures have contributed to the expansion of habitats and spread of insects and various diseases. And uh, you know, this has occurred across the world, Asia, Europe, United States. <clears throat> Significant international trade, both legal and illegal, may contribute to the spread of African horse sickness. It's been proposed that the movement of zebra and other wildlife from South Africa into Thailand in January of this year led to the spread of African horse sickness in the Southeast Asia. Movement of both equids and vectors plays a role in the spread of the virus beyond where we would traditionally think it, it should be located. As previously mentioned, wind can play a significant role in the movement of vectors, and this is what occurred in the Iberian Peninsula in the 1960s. Like the recent detection of African horse sickness in Thailand, the movement of zebras was also identified as the source of the virus for the outbreak that occurred in the Iberian Peninsula in the late 1980s. In this map, you can see the distribution of various Chelicoidae species throughout Europe. And as I previously mentioned, the distribution of these sectors has been expanding, and that's played a huge role in the spread of various viruses, especially blue tongue virus, another arboviral disease, into and throughout Europe, and this occurred in the late 1990s beginning in the late 1990s. <clears throat> this map of the United States shows the distribution of potentially competent vector species of Culicoides. These ranges are also increasing due to changes in our environment. The increasing distribution and detection of both blue tongue and epizootic hemorrhagic disease viral strains within the United States is an indication of the potential problems that we could see if the species, the US midges, US species of midges uh, proved to be efficient vectors at spreading African horse sickness. As you can see, just these three species cover almost the entire continental Europe. So where's the virus being maintained between an epidemic? It could be overwintering, either in the vector population, in the host population, or via an, al an alternative transmission cycle involving an unknown vector or host. We'll discuss these a bit more. Survival in a vector can occur via transovarial transmission, but as I mentioned, there's no evidence so far for this for African horse sickness. And, uh, or we can assume that the virus might be retained in winter overwintering midges. Now this is gonna be climate dependent and assumes an extended Culicoides lifespan. This may possibly have been what happened in Spain in the late 1980s. The virus could also potentially survive in a vertebrate host either in persistent or chronically infected equids, either possibly donkeys or zebras, uh, or via vertical transmission, such as what occurs with other, other arboviruses, such as with blue tongue virus. Or the third alternative is it could be surviving in an unknown vector or host. So far, we know that African horse sickness has been isolated from six species, but that impact, impact is thought to be negligible. Other investigations have yet to determine uh, an unknown vector or host that may be allowing for overwintering. <clears throat> when the midge transmits the virus to the animal, the virus travels to the regional lymph nodes where it replicates. It, from there, it's disseminated throughout the rest of the body via the blood, and this is from a primary viremia. The virus infects the target organs, including the lungs, the spleen, and other lymphoid tissues, and both phagocytes and endothelial cells. And the endothelial cells are actually the primary target of the virus. As the virus multiplies to greater levels, a uh, secondary viremia occurs. This spike in the viral load actually corresponds with the appearance of fever. The tissues start to degrade, and this can cause a cascade of events that usually leads to death in those highly susceptible species. Very high titers of virus may occur, but the viremia only lasts about four to eight days. It has not been detected beyond 21 days in horses. Now in donkeys and zebras, the level of the viremia is usually much lower, but can extend for up to four weeks. And as with blue tongue virus, the African horse sickness virus is sequestered in the cell membrane of the red blood cells. And well, it's sequestered in the red blood cells, it protects, uh, it protects the virus from the effects of the an of circulating antibody. The virus can change both by genetic drift and genetic shift, and its uh, genetic variability is reflected in how it presents in subsequent outbreaks. 
The incubation period of the virus is approximately seven to 14 days, but can be as short as two, depending upon the strain and the amount of virus to which the animal is exposed. The OIE terrestrial code uh, lists the infective period as 40 days for domestic horses. Uh, the U.S. currently requires that any horse coming from a known affected country be either in quarantine or out of that affected country for 60 days prior to entry into the United States. The disease severity depends on numerous factors, and as previously mentioned, the species of animal, the serotype, and the amount of virus that in the exposure all play a key role. Other factors such as individual immune response and the innate resistance and previous exposure or vaccination, as well as other traits may affect the response to exposure. <clears throat> Subsequently, uh, morbidity and mortality rates also vary with species, previous immunity, and the form of the disease. There are four principal manifestations. The subclinical form is also known as horse sickness fever, and this is the mildest form of the disease. Animals usually survive this form. There can be a subacute or cardiac form, an acute or respiratory form, and most commonly a mixed form, which is comprised of the subclinical cardiac form, which is often suddenly followed by marked dyspnea and other signs of the typical pulmonary form. A nervous form can also occur, but it's, it's pretty rare. The horse sickness fever, as I mentioned, is the most mild form. It's typically seen in partially immune animals and in African donkeys and zebras. The incubation period is usually five to 14 days. And it's characterized by moderate remittent fever, usually of a three to eight day period, anorexia, depression, and possibly some mild conjunctivitis, as well as dyspnea. Recovery is usually quite rapid and usually occurs in a few days. As I mentioned, uh, most horses recover from this form. In DICOP or the cardiac form, uh, which is subacute, the incubation period is usually four to nine days. The, it has, uh, it's characterized by high fevers, depression, superorbital non-pitting edema, as well as swelling, petechiation, and eversion of the conjunctiva, edema of the head, the eyelids, the cheeks, the tongue, uh, the, the, the neck can also become very swollen. There could be ventral edema, both along the thorax and the abdomen. Animals are often recumbent and sometimes colicky. Um, often it, it's misconstrued as, as being colic. Uh, clinical signs can usually last four to eight days after the onset, and death occurs at about 50% of these animals, and usually within a week. Duncop, or the respiratory form, is the paracute form of the disease. The incubation for this one is approximately three to five days. It's also characterized by high fever, depression, profuse sweating, uh, redness of the conjunctiva, and a very slow capillary refill time are pretty typical. The animals develop severe pulmonary edema, dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing, coughing. They develop a copious frothy nasal discharge. Uh, these animals often die within 30 minutes to a few hours from the onset of clinical signs and can have a case fatality rate of up to 95%. This is also the type most often observed in dogs that are infected with African horse sickness, and again, they usually often die as well. <clears throat> the mixed, mixed form of the disease is a combination of the previous two types. It's usually diagnosed at necropsy. The incubation period is very similar to the respiratory form, usually three to five days. Clinical signs are often initially respiratory in nature, followed by the edema and the swelling and acute coughing episodes and copious nasal, nasal discharge often occur. Flaps and death usually occurs in three to six days, and about 70% 70, 70 of these animals or greater are affected. <laughs> so as you can see, this animal has a subacute or cardiac form. It's obviously depressed. There's swelling in the supraorbital fossa. This is the normal depression above the eye as well as the chest area. And for most veterinarians that see a horse like this, African horse sickness is not really the typical, uh, it doesn't typically top the list of potential causes, especially in areas where it's not endemic. So additional pictures of the subacute cardiac form, you can see this extensive swelling of the head, the eyelids, the eversion of the conjunctiva. There are other diseases and syndromes that can cause similar signs, However, anytime you see this, you should always be considering African horse sickness as a possibility. <clears throat> 
Here's more evidence of the supraorbital swelling, edema of the conjunctiva, and in this picture you can also see the yellowing of the tissues. In this one, you can see the, where the person's pointing to the area above the uh, superorbital fossa above the horse's eye. Um, as I mentioned, there are numerous other causes for this clinical sign. However, African horse sickness should be a differential diagnosis at any time this is observed. This is pretty severe inversion of the conjunctiva. As you can see, it can be quite extensive. If you see this, you should really be thinking about African horse sickness, even if it's not at the top of your list. <clears throat> this picture is an excellent example of the swelling that can occur in this form of the disease. And believe it or not, this is the same horse once that horse recovered. Quite a, quite a significant difference. These pictures of the respiratory form of the disease are, are quite startling, and you can see this yellowish tinge foam, which is quite common in, in, the foam, in the discharge that comes out of uh, the animals that have this form of the disease. If you see this in the field, you really need to be thinking about the possibility of African horse sickness and act accordingly. <laughs> just want to warn you, uh, this is going to be a video and it may be very difficult to watch, so if you have difficulty with this, you may want to turn away. When you perform a necropsy on a horse with a cardiac form, you may see a yellow gelatinous um, edema or ecchymosis, that discoloration of both the exterior and interior of the heart, as well as potentially hemorrhages of the stomach. <clears throat> if the horse has a pulmonary form, when you, open up, when you open up the chest cavity, the lungs will likely be very heavy. There will be fluid around the heart and the lungs. Uh, you may see small hemorrhages on the exterior of the heart. Uh, it may be enlarged, and, and the, the, the uh, lymph nodes may also be enlarged and may be very heavy. Uh, there may be small hemorrhages in and around the, the intestines, both large and small, and these may be much redder than you would normally expect to see. These are images of the yellow gelatinous edema that I was uh, previously mentioned. If you suspect African horse sickness, I want to make sure that you understand you really need to cut down to the nuchal ligament. Uh, quite often this will have a, a yellow appearance, and this is typically, this typically only occurs in African horse sickness infected animals. So if you're doing a field necropsy and you suspect AHS, cut down to that nuchal ligament and take a look at it. It's not hard to get to. It's an easy thing to take a look at, and it's, it's pretty critical. Here's some more images of that yellow gelatinous edema, and you often see it throughout the body. <clears throat> you can also see injected blood vessels, and ecchymosis can be observed along the serosal surfaces of the organs. There's often a clean, uh, clear yellowish pleural fluid. You'll see that in the chest cavities. You can see in that lower left-hand picture with the person's hands in the, uh, submerged in that fluid. Here's some additional pathology that you might observe, uh, especially with the subacute cardiac form. This, the horse on the left had a myocarditis, and you can, on the horse on the right, you can see the injected blood vessels and the ecchymosis. Uh, <clears throat> in these pictures, you can see the various hemorrhages that might be observed. Uh, you can see it in the heart muscle itself, in the lymph nodes, uh, spleen, along the GI tract. When a horse has their respiratory form, as you can see in that image on the left-hand side, the ribs often will leave indentations on the surface of the lungs. In addition, in addition to the congestion and the discoloration, uh, you might also be able to tell from these pictures that the lungs appear very wet and are much heavier than you would expect them to be. Some more images of very congested and edematous lungs. The, if you look at the cut surface of the lung on the right, you can see where the fluid is oozing out. <clears throat> if you open the trachea, it will often contain thick foam, even, even if you don't observe it in the nostrils or as a, as a discharge. So imagine trying to breathe through this thick material. 
This is one of the reasons that these horses have such difficulty breathing and often collapse and die. In these pictures, you can also see more cut surfaces of the lungs, uh, the fluid and the froth that can be seen from those cut surfaces, along with the abnormalities of the tissues themselves. That includes the hyperemia, the, the, the heavy edematous you know, nature of the tissues. In the mixed form, you're going to see both the cardiac and the pulmonary signs. You are probably going to see froth in the trachea and the heavy, heavy, heavy lungs, the, that yellow gelatinous material, and the ecchymosis and the spleen and the adjacent ligament. <clears throat> so when you're performing a clinical exam on a sick horse, you know, if you suspect African horse sickness, you really need to take the temperature. You know, most likely that animal is going to have a very high fever. Uh, the horse may have reddened, either reddened or pale mucous membranes, uh, but check the capillary refill time because it's probably going to be delayed. Palpate for the pulse, check for edema in the head, the neck, the chest, the abdomen, the legs. Geldings and stallions may have, you know, have swelling in the prepuce and the scrotum, all due to that ventral edema. It, and please, please, please look for signs of dyspnea, difficulty breathing. You know, if you have a stethoscope, listen to the heart, listen to the lungs. You may have muffled heart sounds. You may not be able to hear that heart very well if there's a lot of fluid in the pericardial sac, or even if the lungs are much denser. Um, also, uh, because of all that foam and the fluid that's in the lungs themselves, you may hear crackles and wheezes. The other thing I'd like to mention is that you, even if you don't see a lot of these signs, you see that dyspnea, um, also be looking, when you're looking at the horse, look in those jugular grooves there may be jugular distension, and you may actually see jugular pulses, and sometimes they can be uh, quite noticeable. So be sure to look for those things. And you know, if you're out in the field and you see a horse that's just depressed, and, and these symptoms can be quite subtle, so always be considering the African horse sickness uh, should be considered. It's really easy to overlook. Your differential diagnoses when you see horses like this or horses that have suspect of African horse sickness, you should always be worried about anthrax, equine infectious anemia, especially in the U.S. We don't have very many cases of it anymore, but uh, there are still some that occur. Uh, past several years, it's been roughly 35 to 40 cases. Um, this disease is also known as swamp fever. It can pre uh, present with either an initial or recurring acute episodes, and those usually last for one to three days. It's characterized by fever, depression, thrombocytopenia. Signs can be really mild and transitory and can often uh, mirror those of African horse sickness. Equine viral arteritis, uh, uh, this disease has very similar clinical signs to that of African horse sickness. It's usually characterized by fever, depression, anorexia, a lot of dependent edema, especially the lower hind limbs, the scrotum, and the prepuce. Conjunctivitis, the supra and periorbital edema, like I previously mentioned. Nasal discharge, respiratory distress. You know, these are all very similar and compatible with African horse sickness as well. Other diseases are trypanosomiasis. This is a parasitic disease. Equine encephalosis. This is a virus very. It's related to the African horse sickness virus. As I mentioned, this one's only been discovered in South Africa and uh, Israel, so not likely to occur in the U.S., but should be a differential. Equine periplasmosis, this is another uh, protozoal disease. Uh, it's a protozoal infection, and uh, it, it can be very difficult to, to diagnose as well. It is often, uh, here recently, last several years, has been concurrently uh, identified in cases with EIA. Uh, but that's a whole other presentation, so I won't go into that. But the clinical signs of periplasmosis can, can include an acute fever, inapidence, malaise, anemia, jaundice, uh, sudden death, so very similar to those of African horse sickness. So always be thinking of AHS in the background. Purple hemorrhagica is a sequelae to Streptococcus equi infection. This is a very common bacterial infection in the United States. Uh, but purpura is actually caused from, it's a secondary sequelae that's caused from bleeding of the capillaries. It often leads to red splotching of both the skin and the mucous membranes. Edema of the limbs and the head are, are typically observed. Um, it most often, most often occurs in very young animals, and it's often fatal. So it could also be confused with African horse sickness. And another foreign animal disease, 
is hendrovirus, and this one can infect both horses and humans. So keep that as a differential as well. So when you're going to try to do diagnostics for African horse sickness, you want unclotted blood. It's needed to perform the virus isolation and the virus neutralization test. Uh, if you're unsure which anticoagulant to use, just contact the laboratory. The laboratory that performs this testing is the uh, Diagnostic Virology Laboratory in Ames. Uh, so you can call them. You can also reach out to Saddle, and they can point you in the right direction if you, if you don't recall that the testing is done in Ames. <clears throat> just remember that when you collect the blood, you, you can chill it, but don't freeze it, because that, what that will do is the freezing lysis the red blood cells, and it actually interferes with performing of the test. You also want to collect appropriate tissues and send those tissues to the lab, also chilled, not frozen. And if you're going to do serology, you have animals that have survived and you want to, to uh, or appear to have a very mild form and you want to test them, uh, do paired sear on those animals. You want to collect them uh, preferably 21 days apart, allow the blood to clot in the tube, thin it, collect the serum off of the clot into a different tube, and then freeze that. And you can store it until you collect the second sample send them at the same time, and then you'll have your paired, paired testing. So there are various cell types that can be used to, uh, for virus isolation, as well as eggs and newborn mice. Uh, and the newborn mice, you inoculate with eggs and the newborn mice with the, with the sample. Um, the virus is easily identified via an ELISA and can be, is stereotyped by virus neutralization. Uh, the virus neutralization uh, was the gold standard for the diagnosis but this, this test takes a minimum of up to five days to complete. So you're going to want a faster uh, diagnosis than what that can provide. Fortunately, there are uh, PCR assays now that are specific for African horse sickness and detect all nine serotypes. And as I previously mentioned, that serotyping occurs with probes to that VP2 spike gene. The horses that survive infection will develop serotype-specific antibodies and this usually occurs within 8 to 12 days post-infection. These antibodies are, are quickly detectable uh, by the various methods, which include the indirect ELISA. Um, complement fixation can also be used, as well as immunoblotting, virus neutralization for antibody detection, immunodiffusion, and hemagglutination inhibition tests. Of course, it's always better to prevent a disease than to try to control and eradicate one. So if African horse sickness is suspected in a free area, previously free area, region or country, you must first identify that virus and then determine which serotype. Uh, that type, uh, determination of stereotyping can take a little time. So in the meantime, you want to implement strict movement controls and, and quarantine zones. Um, you can, you'll want to perform euthanasia of the infected and exposed animals, although especially in the United States, yeah, this may be an extremely difficult and emotional process, as uh, most horse owners in the U.S. are very attached to their animals and consider them to be family, your family members. So it's going to be a difficult situation. Um, all equids should be in an insect-proof housing, kept inside from dusk till dawn, and other vector control measures, including environmental and topical chemicals, should be instituted. Uh, you'll want to check the temperatures at least twice a day, check for the elevations in, in, in temperature uh, fever spikes. And if a vaccine is available for, and approved for use, uh, those should be considered for all susceptible animals. Uh, as what happened in Taiwan, after they finally identified the, uh, the strain that was circulating, uh, they actually implemented, they were able to implement vaccination of all equids in the entire country. In areas or regions uh, or countries that are known to be affected with African horse sickness, uh, annual vaccination along with regular vector control and disinfection of the facilities should be consistently implemented. And while this virus is very hardy, it is susceptible to pH change. So when an animal dies, it, the virus itself usually dies with the onset of rigor mortis. <clears throat> so the risk of contamination from carcasses is very minimal. There are numerous types of vaccines that have been developed. These include polyvalent vaccines, which include multiple strains, as well as monovalent vaccines that have only one strain. Now, those must be matched to the circulating strain of the virus. Um, also, there have been subunit and recombinant vaccines developed. 
you know, for all the vaccines, multiple doses several weeks apart are required to obtain a sufficient immune response. And while vaccines are regularly used in areas that are currently endemic with African horse sickness, there are no approved or licensed vaccines in the United States. Fortunately, public health concerns are very minimal. African horse sickness hasn't been shown to cause naturally occurring disease in humans, although for those workers who've been exposed to uh, modified live vaccines, there have been cases of both encephalitis and retinitis observed in, 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 in humans. So African horse sickness is, the virus is a select agent. It can only be handled in a biosafety level three laboratory, and this can only occur with special permissions and extensive regulations. The OIE has multiple sources of information. The OIE terrestrial code lists uh, special provisions regarding the disease. They discuss country freedom from disease status, the establishment of containment zones, recovery of free status, recommendations for importation of animals from uh, AHS free and affected countries or zones, the importation of equine semen or in vivo derived oocytes or embryos, information on protecting animals from chelicoides, and other various topics on surveillance. The terrestrial manual discusses the disease and identification of the virus, as well as serological testing and vaccines. If you'd like additional information, I would suggest reading these manuals, which can be found on the OIE website. Quarantine requirements for entry in the United States are described in 9 CFR 93. And in addition, uh, during quarantine, equids must undergo inspection and also testing for EIA, ferroplasmosis, during and glanders. And in some cases, disinfections and precautionary treatments may be required. And these are, are to determine freedom from infection and or infestation with parasites. As previously mentioned, African or APHIS requires a 60-day uh, quarantine period for uh, equids or uh, 60-day time frame prior to importation in the United States of all equids that are coming from regions that are considered to be AHS affected. And uh, when those animals are in 60-day quarantine in the United States, testing for AHS isn't really conducted as the period actually exceeds the uh, designated incubation period of 40 days as listed by the OIE. So that 60-day period is considered to be sufficient for uh, detection if AHS would happen to be incubating in an animal. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation today and we'll take some questions if you have any. Okay. We can add questions in the chat. Um, please uh, have them go to all um, panelists. Uh, we do have one question. Um, with the subclinical form, are affected equids immune on recovery? In the subclinical form, so yes, they do develop antibodies and um, are immune for a period of time. Uh, specifically to that, the, the serotype that they were infected with, uh, depending upon the serotype, they may have some cross-reactivity and cross-protection from other, other uh, strains but that's not 100%. So it really depends on which virus is circulating and um, you know, which strain they were affected with. Uh, there, there's, no, uh, there's no evidence of any cross protection against any other type of uh, orbiviruses either. So um, yeah, they could become infected with another type of or orbivirus such as the equine encephalosis virus. The next question we have, was vaccination of humans with MLV intentional or accidental? Accidental, definitely accidental. <laughs> okay. Um, the next question is, I realize that the monkeys were experimentally infected, but is there any concern about this orbivirus potentially causing clinical disease in humans, especially in non-endemic areas, or any theories on why this has not happened, since this virus doesn't seem to be extremely species-specific? The virus is actually, it really is species specific in that it affects solopeds primarily. Um, humans don't have the receptors, at least most humans don't have the receptors, with similar receptors for the virus that the equines have and are not as susceptible 
to infection with the uh, with the virus, and and that's also why it doesn't affect other other species of animals as well. So it's a it's a fairly rare occurrence in non equid species. If a BMO sees a horse suffering with possible signs of severe AHS, do we have a welfare responsibility to euthanize it immediately, or should we encourage the owner to not euthanize? To a satirize, even if that might be inhumane. This is a very difficult question. Uh, we always need to consider uh, you know, ethical considerations. Um, working with owners may be very difficult, even if you're a, you know, a veterinarian in clinical practice. This is always a, a difficult thing to deal with. Um, you know, a lot of these horses may present as colic, and even though you may suspect African horse sickness. Uh, if the owner thinks the horse is colicking, they may want to try to treat. Um, if an animal is extremely ill and, you know, like I said, most of these animals will will die suddenly. Um, they they can survive and struggle for you know for several days, but typically they do die fairly quickly. Uh, it's very difficult to watch. Uh, most owners will will likely agree to euthanize. Um, if they're not that severe, though, they may hesitate in, in, in you know, proceeding with that euthanasia. It's really going to have to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you can recommend it, but ultimately it's going to be their decision if you don't have a definitive diagnosis. The next question is, is there a vaccine for humans in use? No, there's not. And the reason for that is that humans aren't normally affected by African horse sickness, so there was, there's no impetus to develop a vaccine. What risk is there from contamination of an area due to field necropsy? So this is not a, a virus that's transmitted by contact. So even if you have contamination of the area, you know, you're gonna have to either have iatrogenic transmission uh, dirty needles, as occurs with EIA and paraplasmosis, or um, you know, midges you know, and, and you know, other vectors. Uh, so you know, midges aren't going to feed on a dead animal, and like I said, rigor mortis will usually kill the virus. So you know, if you're doing the necropsy post rigor mortis onset, then that is extremely slight chance of contamination in the environment itself. Okay, what protocols are in place related to importation of products from importation of cut flowers or produce from endemic areas, such as the vectors in those products? So this would be under the purview of the PPQ. It's the, you know, the branch of APHIS that does the plant protection quarantine. And I am not completely familiar with those regulations. I do know that inspections occur at, you know, at importation sites, and um, you know, truckloads and uh, containers are typically you know, observed and treated. Insecticides, things like that, occur. Um, beyond that, I can't provide any additional information. I would suggest, though, going on to the PPQ website, and there might be additional information on that site. Okay, um, how likely is that an infected midge could be brought over? It's always a possibility. You know, they could always hop a ride on an airplane, but you know, it's, probably, it's probably not gonna have the, the amount of viral load necessary to actually infect a horse, and uh, the likelihood that it would be able to live long enough to get from an airplane onto a horse is another consideration. So it's extremely unlikely. Okay, is it possible to elaborate on vector control strategies previously applied in outbreak situations? Yes, yeah, as I mentioned in the presentation, you know, netting, providing a vector-proof environment for horses. Um, you know, obviously, bug sprays are useful. Um, trying to think, really anything that you would you would introduce for your know, control of, of mosquitoes or flies would also be uh, incorporated for use with midges, although midges are, are much smaller than both mosquitoes and flies. Um, but definitely netting, 
and the chemicals, do you spraying the, the facilities or spraying the animals themselves to prevent the midges, the midges from lighting on the animals? Okay. Did you say Thailand's outbreak came from storm migration of Tulacoides? No. Uh, the outbreak in Thailand is believed to have been the importation, and it's unknown whether this was legal importation or illegal importation of essentially zebras and other wildlife species. They observed uh, late in the night uh, from one of the airports in Thailand back in January, they observed a shipment of uh, wildlife that included zebras, and um, it was shortly after that shipment arrived in Thailand that the first case of African horse sickness was detected. Um, subsequently, there was spread. There are uh, numerous vectors, competent vectors in that region. And while Thailand uh, had a bunch of um, and numerous cases and numerous detections, they were able, as I mentioned, to vaccinate the majority of the equids in that country. However, subsequent to that, uh, there was also detection in Malaysia, which is very close to Thailand. But the thought is all that came from the importation of you know, zebras in that shipment. Has there ever been um, AHS in South America? Not that I'm aware. Okay. And we're coming down to the end of the questions. Is the insect control for AHS the same as normal vector control for horses? Or are there additional controls recommended? And by the way, great presentation. Thank you. Um, no, they're, they're basically the same for horses. There's no additional uh, recommendations for protection for African horse sickness. It's, it, you know, whatever vector uh, control methods you implement for um, other, other diseases, other parasites, would be the same for AHS. Was AHS detected in the U.S.? And Nothing I'm aware of. Yeah. No. If a practitioner suspects AHS, who should they contact? Diagnostic Virology Laboratory in Ames. Oh, well, first you want to contact your, your state animal health official and your AVIC, right. and they'll uh, let them be aware so that they can be putting things in motion, but they'll likely want you to contact Ames to talk about, uh, to, you request information on what samples they prefer for you to collect, how many samples you know, will depend on the number of animals that are affected, um, whether you're able, whether the animals are alive or dead, so whether you're able to, to collect tissues or only blood, and um, uh, your capability to get those shipped to them you know, quickly. And this is just a clarification. The paired serum that we should take 21 days apart, it is for AHS subacute forms where the horses survive? Yes. If, if you suspect a – okay, for two, two things. If you, have, if you suspect a horse has had AHS and – let me back up. So you're not going to do that until you know that you've got AHS in the country. It's not something that you're going to do on a regular basis. If you see a horse and it's, it's got clinical symptoms, we don't typically test for foreign animal diseases um, on a regular basis unless we um, you know, are highly suspicious of it and, uh, and or have, have had detections in the past. So in the U.S., because we've not had African horse sickness, you know, if you see a depressed animal, and because these symptoms are so vague, these, uh, you're not going to just test every animal out there that you see that's, that's depressed and uh, has symptoms that are compatible with it. You know, if you really suspect that animals have died on the on the facility and they have you know, you've done a necropsy, you've opened that that nuchal ligament, you've seen that yellowing, you've seen other clinical signs that are very compatible. Obviously, you're going to want, going to, want to test those animals. If once those once an African horse sickness case has been detected from that type of, of collection, then if there are subsequent cases of animals that are around that original suspect animal, then those are the ones that you would want to collect um, the 21-day apart serology for. And this could be used for surveillance. Uh, it could be used for, you know, animals on the same, you know, same property that, that maybe 
uh, had very mild clinical signs, but that recovered. Um, obviously, if you've got an extremely sick animal, that's not going to be your your diagnosis, of, your diagnostic method of choice. Are you aware of any horses breaking with confirmed infection while in U.S. import quarantine? No. To my knowledge, there's some very similar questions here. To my knowledge, AHS has never occurred in the Western Hemisphere. Okay. Can the virus replicate in insects? Yes, and it actually does. Um, part of the, the, the life cycle is in the midges. Okay. You did not mention certain intoxications as differentials. Can you mention what those would be? I can't think of any intoxications off the top of my head that would be considered as the differentials. Um, I would have to leave that question to a, a toxicologist. Okay. And the last question we have in the chat is, would transport of a carcass to a diagnostic laboratory pose any risk of spread of AHS? It shouldn't. However, um, your animal health officials in the state and your AVIC may not want to take the risk of transporting animals to any locations. They may want to uh, limit, regionally limit and contain uh, the animals within a, 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 a premise. So that's going to be entirely up to the AVIC and then the state animal health official as to whether you, trans, you know, uh, transfer that horse to a diagnostic facility. Okay, well, we're almost at the top of the hour, and we do not have any other questions in the chat. Um, so I'd like to thank Tracy again for uh, presenting today. You've got a lot of nice comments in the chat about great presentation, which I really appreciate. Um, and you. I just want to let everyone know we have another webinar coming up on Monday, November 23rd at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard. And the topic is epidemiology for non-epidemiologists. So anybody interested? Um, we will make sure that uh, we're on there on time and you can join us. Um, and I have one question to come in. Dr. Sturgill provide her email address and I can put that in the chat right now. Absolutely, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out. All right, thank you very much. And hang on the line, Tracy and uh, We'll chat for a bit and then we'll say goodbye and have a great afternoon, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending today's webinar. The conference has now ended and you may disconnect.